Skype. Too. Oh, that's right. That's right. We're ready. We are ready. Are we ready? We're all ready? Yeah. Good morning, Scott County. It's always good to see you. We're going to call the May 5th Scott County Board of Commissioners to order. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance, Allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. All right, number two, amendments to the agenda. We do have two amendments to the agenda. I think you have them before you. We're going to... Um, Label the one where we're going to have an informational update from, from our representative and our senator as 6.2. And then we're going to discuss a letter to the governor as 6.3. Mr. Chair, with those amendments, I will approve the agenda. Motion. Second. And a second. Any discussion? Otherwise, I will look to Deb to give us a roll call. Commissioner Weckman Brecky. Aye. Commissioner Wolf. Aye. Commissioner Beard. Aye. Commissioner Beer. Aye. Commissioner Ulrich. Aye. I should mention, I always forget this, that we are social distancing. We have very few folks in the gallery. We have people out in the hallway and we're doing roll call votes. Um, we are all present. We have one on the phone, so, um, <coughs> or via Skype. So we are all, all here. Uh, number three, approve the minutes of the April 21st, 2020 County Board meeting. We've had those distributed in our packets. Are there any changes or? Mr. Amendments. Mr. Chair, I'll move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Otherwise, I will look to Deb again. Commissioner Weckman Brecky. Aye. Commissioner Wolf. Aye. Commissioner Beard. Aye. Commissioner Beer. Aye. Commissioner Ulrich. Aye. All right, I guess those should be hanging on the gavel. Passes. Uh, number four, now we're to the point to where we recognize interested citizens for folks to come and address the board for whatever they may want for five minutes. It's a great opportunity. We did have somebody, I believe, at the post at the door in case anyone wanted to come. Otherwise, we're always available and do answer our emails or phone calls. So please do not let um, the travel stop you from trying to get a hold of us. So is there any interested citizens in the moment? Seeing none, we're going to pass on to the consent agenda. Uh, this is where these will pass in one motion. They've been vetted through the staff, and I will just read through them. 5.1, adopt resolution number 2020-086, confirming May 7th, 2020, as National Day of Prayer in Scott County. 5.2, adopt resolution number 2020-079, authorizing entering into a cooperative agreement with the City of Shakopee for operation, maintenance, and repair of the event traffic management system. 5.3, adopt resolution number 2020-081, rejecting all bids for the Workforce Development Center Roof Replacement Project. 5.4, adopt resolution number 2020-082, authorizing submittal of a better utilizing investments to leverage development or the build grant application for U.S. <laughs> Highway 169 Freight Mobility and Safety Investments in Jordan and Sand Creek Township. 5.5, Adopt resolution number 2020-083, authorizing submittal of transportation projects to the Transportation Advisory Board for consideration in the 2020 regional solicitation process. 5.6, adopt resolution number 2020-080, approving the City of Elko New Market 2040 Comprehensive Surface Water Management Plan, dated December 2019. 5.7, Adopt resolution number 2020-087, authorizing entering into a three-party right-of-way contribution agreement with Canterbury Park Entertainment, LLC, the City of Shakopee, and Scott County to facilitate right-of-way needs for the County Highway 83 modernization project. Thank you very much, folks. 5.8, approve an amendment to the Master Service Agreement with Goosebusters, Inc., for Dr. Michael Wilcox, MD, to establish a jail nursing <coughs> contingency plan. 5.9, adopt resolution number 2020-085, recognizing the financial impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and update to the county's financial policy to include modifications for abatements of property tax, penalty, and interest, and rescinding resolutions number 94064, 2001-005 and 2008-146 and all other prior policies not identified and disavow all informal procedures in place up to the current act. 
and 5.10, approve payroll processing of personnel actions. Those are the 10 items on consent. Is there any that would like pulled, discussed? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, two things. Um, the uh, National Day of Prayer resolution, I don't need, think we need to pull it and discuss it, but if it could be read before we vote on the consent agenda, I think that would be entirely appropriate. Uh, the second thing is 5.9 on our tax uh, penalty abatement policy. I'd like to pull that for a brief discussion. All right. So we would like the uh, 5.1 read, which I love, um, 5.9. So I'll make sure that we will pull that one for a presentation. So we want to get motions on that and then we'll read it. Is that I'm looking to Leslie? That works, it works for me. I will move the other items on consent then, Mr. Chair. Absent 5.9, okay, we have a motion. Second. And a second. So for the discussion piece, let's read that uh, National Day of Prayer. I'm looking down to my left, I have it here, uh, but I- Please, read it. All right. Thank you very much. Here we go, this is resolution number 2020-086, confirming May 7th, 2020 as National Day of Prayer in Scott County. Whereas a National Day of Prayer was first declared in 1863 by President Abraham Lincoln, and whereas the annual observance of National Day of Prayer was established in 1952 by President Harry Truman and the United States Congress, and whereas in 1988, the United States Congress and President Ronald Reagan confirmed the National Day of Prayer to be the first Thursday in May of each year, and whereas the National Day of Prayer affords an opportunity for individuals of different and varied spiritual and religious faiths and backgrounds an opportunity to unite for a common purpose, and whereas the National Day of Prayer will be observed in Scott County on Thursday, May 7, 2020. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of Commissioners in and for the County of Scott, Minnesota, do hereby confirm Thursday, May 7th, 2020, as a National Day of Prayer in Scott County. And if there was ever such a time as we need prayer, in my humble opinion, it is the days we are living in. So I'd also just like to add, it's Thursday, May 7th, mm -hmm. but every day you can pray. This is true. Um, but we're just declaring this as a county as the National Day of Prayer. Amen. Yes, sir. We got an amen. We want to make sure that was on the record for the microphone. We had an amen from the gallery. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's important, I think, and, and from another perspective, I've been thinking about um, as we all sit at home alone or, or do things in small groups, uh, we've lost the sense of congregating. Um, and I think it's uh, if we learn, we're going to learn many things out of this whole strange time that we're in, but that as human beings, we love to congregate. We're social beings. Mm -hmm. And the uh, idea that we have something we can rally around on Thursday, that uh, no matter your perspective on politics, ideology, response to the current uh, pandemic or whatever, we can all bow our hearts and our heads and do something together. And I think that's a very important thing at this time. I'll give you an amen to that as well as I look out to the gallery. Are there other amen? Um, all right, that is awesome. Um, thank you for doing that. So we have a motion, we have a second on the consent minus 5.9. Looking to Deb, let's ratify. Commissioner Ruckman Brecky. Aye. Commissioner Wolf. Aye. Commissioner Beard. Aye. Commissioner Beer. Aye. And Commissioner Ulrich. Aye. Consent agenda passes minus 5.9. How do we wanna do that? We wanna look at that now, I'm looking out the window. If we're going to pull that 5.9 for a presentation, do we want to discuss that at this particular point in time? Or I'm looking to Leslie? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to make my intent clear, I would like to make the motion to get it on the table uh, for discussion, and then presentation can be part of the discussion and back and forth, if I may. So, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move that we adopt Resolution 2020-085, recognizing the financial impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, an update to this county's financial policy to include modifications for abatements on property tax penalty and interest and rescinding these previous resolutions, et cetera, et cetera. That's my motion. So we have a motion. Second. And we have a second. So now is the time of discussion and we're all looking to Cindy. Can there, I, is, is there anything that you want specifically? Yes, let me, let me set this up for a few moments if I may. Um, this week I got probably the most heartfelt phone call I've gotten concerning this whole thing uh, from a local business owner um, who's probably, uh, well, he's, he's facing losing his property. And I mean, this guy has been at this for years 
and he's in one of the zones that um, uh, has been hardest hit uh, by what's been going on. Um, the shutdown is, is, is killing him. Uh, I, I, see there, I know there's several people in this boat, um, but I'm not so sure that the public response to what's going on might not have been kicking him in the financial shins pretty hard anyhow, regardless of government action. But I think it's an opportunity for us just to uh, briefly describe again to the people who are watching, because I know there's a few folks watching us this morning that maybe missed the thoughtful discussion that went into our presentation two weeks ago when we came up with this resolution, and I want them to be, uh, to be party to that. We just have a brief discussion again on how we came to the $100,000, uh, because it seems arbitrary and to some capricious, especially when we've made it 100000 per year, and your tax load went up because we rechanged the valuation on your property, and now instead of being 87000 it's now 119000 I'm just grabbing some representative numbers. So, um, but I think there's a learning moment here for us, just about some, my, at least my philosophy of government, if I can share it with folks. Um, people look to government to be compassionate, and folks, we can't. All we can be is even-handed, as even-handed as we think we can be. But compassion is a human trait that's exercised by the humans that are elected to be in government, but at some point, government has to have a heavy hammer and the force of the law on their side. And so when we call a shot like this, there are a lot of people we're, that are saying thank you, and there's a few people just outside the gate who are going, what about me, what about me? And when you're looking at losing your business, that is a heartfelt plea, what about me? But I think there's a couple things we can learn here, uh, and I'd like to just underscore, um, government, is a blunt and powerful instrument that's necessary because men are not angels. I've said that several times. But at some point, we need 700 people running this county to make sure the roads are plowed and the toilets flush and that people stop on red and things like that. Taxes are how that gets paid for. And we have two times a year when we pay our real estate taxes, May 15th and October 15th. And because of the current pandemic, we, as humans, are trying to do something thoughtful and compassionate, which is forgive the penalties and interest that are accruing for just 60 days. It's a small step, but it's a step. It's not the same as what Carver's doing or Dakota's doing, but it's what we in Scott County decided we would do. So to those of you that are out there struggling, I want you to listen again to the brief discussion on how we arrived at the $100,000 number what we may or may not be able to do because as soon as we move that goalpost, we're now impinging on somebody else and with the best of intentions, um, unintended consequences happen. And so I think that probably sets it up about as good as we can at the moment. But let's let Ms. Geis explain again to us why it was a wise decision, the wisest one we thought we could make two weeks ago and why we may or may not want to move the goalpost. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Commissioner Beard, thank you for bringing this up. This topic and has been a very dear to many people's hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not the only one getting calls, particularly as we get closer to May 15th, the calls are coming into the office as well. You feel the heartfelt plea to say, mm -hmm. I don't understand, my business is down 80%, 90%, my business is closed, I don't have any income. Uh, the healthcare industries are closed for the most part unless there's urgency. So we, we're hearing from a multiple group of, of, of taxpayers, whether they're in that restaurant, hotel industry. Uh, we haven't heard much from the entertainment industry, of course, which we're heavily involved with. We have heard from um, healthcare, hospitals, you know, those types of, of industries that are saying, we're not gonna be able to meet the guidelines that we have set forth within this resolution. We established a, a, a policy many, many years ago, uh, and believe it or not, as Leslie and I were researching the policy, which we really couldn't find anywhere within our policies, we found out there's, there was a whole realm of things that have been discussed over the last 40 years that we found within some of our historical documents. 
In every one of these, we continued to state within these policies that at no time would we ever consider a financial hardship the reason to abate. Most likely because every, there are many, many people that have financial hardships. And because of the services that we do here at the county and the amount of people that depend upon those services to continue, and because the majority of our budget is financed by property taxes, the ability to abate taxes or to waive taxes or to imp not imp apply the same level of law to all the properties equally would be unfair and unjust to many others. So we have to do what we have to do in the best, in our best mindset and our due diligence to make sure that there's a fairness across all of the tax base. When we, when we got into this pandemic, of course, it is a time of, a time that none of us have ever experienced and our predecessors for many, many years before us have not experienced. And so as we continue to think about what do we do when we have industries that are entirely closed and when we're looking out broadly across all of our taxpayers, we considered more of our small property owners as that's maybe the level we need to stay within. The larger ones, the more corporate ones, hopefully over the course of time have done their due diligence and held, put their money aside to say, I have a piggy bank that I can use to pay my property taxes in the event that I endure a hardship. So as we were going through all of our parcels, we said, all right, if we had to do a, some level of metric, let's try to figure out what that balance would be. When do we hit maybe more so those corporate taxpayers versus those smaller mom and pop taxpayers? We extracted a bunch of data, did some pivot tables and said by owner, not by parcel, but because we know that there are many parcels that could make up a singular taxpayer or there's a taxpayer that owns a ton of properties across our county we did a taxpayer search and combined those and of that we had oh we had 725 parcels that um, and a uh, hundred and ninety four owners that would have been impacted and with that we had Seventy million sixty-eight thousand fifty dollars in total. Well, this is anybody a hundred thousand dollars and more. That's what we were looking at, and so we're saying, okay, so those people would not be impacted by this. Everybody else, the little small people, would be impacted. We heard pleas from those folks that are like, but I'm at a hundred and two thousand, or I'm at a hundred and four thousand, and this I'm just not reaching this this threshold that you've set. Why did you set a threshold? because everybody's plea is different. It's not based upon my taxes, it's based upon my industry and my business. So how can you state, and this is the some things that I've been getting, that my hardship is so much less than those smaller industries? And that is a policy question. It's like, where do you cut that off? We also did a research up to, well, what if we move it to 200,000? And if that's the case, we have 93 owners and we have $57 million worth of people that would not qualify. So we do have about $20 million gap. We have about 100 people, prox 80 to 100 people that would now be able to qualify for this one time abatement. But remember, it is just an abatement of penalty. It is not abatement of tax. There is no interest accruing on it because it's current year tax only. Mm -hmm. If these people have delinquent taxes, this pandemic is not what's caused them the hardship. They've been enduring a hardship because of the business over the course of some years. So this would be an abatement of penalty only through July 15th, as long as those taxes have been postmarked by July 15th. We also know that that's gonna be a hit to our, our budget as well. And so we're trying to make those budget adjustments just like every other industry out there is trying to. We understand that even at a county government level, the sales tax, the gas tax, the penalty and interest, any types of those fees that we get, and our you know, business is different these days. And so how do we bridge that gap? And there's gonna be some hard decisions made here as well. And so when we look to our policymakers, we ask them, where, where do we draw the line on fair and just? 
with this penalty and, and uh, penalty waiver, we put some conditions in this RBA, and that is, you can't be escrowed. You're still paying your your taxes through your mortgage payment, and so the bank is holding your money, and the bank needs to release those funds, and they are. We're getting those escrow payments in. You can't be utility properties and railroad properties because they're still operational as is. So we wanted to exclude those. And then we, add, then we wanted to put the threshold in. It isn't going to be everybody. It's not going to be a broad, everybody gets a waiver until July 15th because that in and of itself is unfair and unjust because people's situations are different. And then lastly, we talked about you have to have a just cause. You have to provide us evidence as to how this pandemic has harmed you to make sure that when, when the statute talks about the, the impo imposition of a penalty would be unjust or unfair, mm -hmm. this is where we will go to the law and say, in our minds and in your minds as policymakers, you set that, that uh, definition of unjust and hardship um, same and similar to if the county, a local, state, or federal government calls an emergency, uh, de declares an emergency. Those are the terms under which we will consider a financial abatement, a financial hardship, and an abatement of penalty to a certain period of time. So the historical and the conversations that we've had in the past, we went to $100,000 because we thought that that would at least give those small mom and pop <coughs> types of businesses some ability to have a little bit of extra time to get their pay taxes paid. But it is not a waiver of taxes, and it's not an abatement of taxes, and we need to make sure that our people and our taxpayers are clear about that. Two months from now, when we started ta thinking about July 15th, so they paid their taxes in October, so they were functioning November, December, January, February, and into the good, good port of March, where that's they're gaining their tax revenue to pay their first half in May. I need to make sure that you as a board and policymakers, if they're having a difficult time only being closed for six weeks, paying the May, what does that mean for paying the October? So this is going to be something that is going to, we're going to have more conversations about this, I am sure, over the course of this mm -hmm. year. But today we're only here talking about the May 15th payment and trying to ensure that those taxpayers that are small or have been impacted, whether they're commercial or residential, that they have some ability to contact the county, make an application for the waiver of penalty. Mr. Chairman, um, Commissioner Beer, we also have been in contact <laughs> with the other local agencies, because remember, this isn't just the county that's impacted. Um, there are cities and school districts who have issues with making payroll until September as well and making sure their teachers are paid and their employees are paid. There's a couple of them that just extending this had concerns with those types of keeping their local governments running. Um, so far, everybody has seemed you know, supportive and okay through that July t time period if things are made. But if it extends longer or if it's a larger amount of dollars that we're talking about, that does become problematic for some of our local government partners. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, just a, a comment to that and then back to Cindy. <clears throat> if we're going to have businesses that can't pay, um, it's different than we're giving them a holiday. They just don't have cash to pay or even a partial payment. Um, we're going to be facing this anyhow. Uh, having said that, to be fair, if they're in that boat, uh, two month abatement on the penalties probably isn't going to make the difference unless Valley Fair opens tomorrow and these hotels fill up and the restaurants fill up by next Monday. And I doubt that's going to happen. i talking to friends in South Dakota and Iowa where now they've been open, restaurants have been open for a week or so, and the attendance at the restaurants is pretty skimpy. So just saying, um, that's out there. Um, but uh, for just for our point of reference, Cindy, if my taxes were 120,000 a year, and I skipped my May 15th payment of 60,000, what would the penalty be about? Well, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Beard, uh, the penalty goes up every single month. 
So your first would be a 2% hit, and then it goes up 1%, and then 1%. It gets to 6% by October. Then after that, it's 2%, 2%, 2% to get to the 12% penalty. The unpaid balance. Correct. Okay. Correct. So what we're looking at is from here until, until July 15th. Months. Correct. But je so May 16th is a 2% penalty. Then June 1st is another 1%, so 3. July 1st would be 4. So it would be a 4% penalty on the first half. 60000 so that would be about $2,400. $240. Oh, two hundred and forty dollar penalty. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, just to be clear, this this is the kind of thing we're dealing with here. Okay, boy, if they're going to pay in July anyhow, and the penalty is going to be two hundred and forty dollars for being two months late. Okay, that gives us some perspective. Will you accept partial payments on the tax bill? Good question, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Beard. We accept partial bit partial tax payments all the time. Okay. We have never limited. I know that there are county, 2400 It is $2,400, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, $6,000 times 4%. Yeah. Um, $60,000. Uh, so we have, um, I lost my train of thought. What was I talking partial, about? Partial payments. Partial payments. Yeah. Make, people make partial payments all the time. The only time where it gets a little sticky, a sticky widget, is on that delinquent tax where maybe the first year is what causes the lien against the property. Remember, that sets the clock to forfeiture. Mm -hmm. And so those are, it's the only time frame that we need to make sure that we're uh, a little bit different and we try to put those people on more of a payment plan that makes sure that we're in alignment with the law. But other than that, if we get payments in, we pay them in inverse order all the time. So we always pay the most current to the most delinquent and as long as folks continue to pay, we seem to be in fairly good shape. And Mr. Chair, the, um, oh, Cindy, I was sorry, I tripped over the 2400. Okay. Oh, the clock, the clock. So if I don't pay my taxes on May 15th and I come and see you in July and pay the $2,400 penalty with my taxes, uh, that's when that's due. But suppose I can't. How far do I have to go before you start the clock again on tax forfeiture? It's yeah, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Beard, the, the forfeiture starts with the first year delinquent. So if you don't pay your taxes in May, as of January 2nd, you're really delinquent. Then we start send, sending you the formal notifications. There's many different types of ways that we have to inform you that we're going to set a lien against your property. That lien is set approximately in March. That sets the clock. And then you have these 60 days to redeem. And then otherwise in starting, it's usually like the three years from that May that we would actually go at forfeiture. So there's some period of time, but, but the further back they get, the more difficult it is to come up with not only current year taxes, but all these delinquents. So we try to really have conversations with those folks to put them on a payment plan right away. So they're continuing to keep their current current and they're trying to make those steady payments against their delinquents so that they don't lose their property. Mr. Chairman and Ms. Geis, the point I'm trying to make, or I'd like the, the public to understand is, we're not sitting here waiting to take people's businesses in forfeiture or their land. That there's about a three year window before the hammer has to fall because we're the government, we have a big hammer, and we have to do that. It's part of the justice thing. Um, but we're, there's a period of time in here where your department is actually working with the landowner, the taxpayer, to try to right the ship keep it afloat and get them back in good standing. And I think that's an important point that we uh, we should all understand, every taxpayer in the county. So. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Beard, when with, in our department, we go a little bit above and beyond what the law requires. We allow, the law requires to notify them in when we set the lien. So then they see that it's filed in court, that there's a lien established against this property. Every... <coughs> Within six weeks after the due date, we're <coughs> sending notice of past due or notice mm -hmm. of delinquency, and it includes all of their past due taxes as well as their current. Okay. The state law doesn't require us to do that. We do that as a friendly reminder to our taxpayers so that they don't get 
um, they aren't alarmed when they get the final notice saying your property is going to forfeit in three and a half years later. They truly have a good understanding of exactly what's going on in there and we ask them to call us and have us help them try to establish a payment plan to try to get those caught up. Well, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to belabor the point here, but I want us to be very clear with the public that we're working with because this is part of the unpleasant part of being in government. Sometimes you have to follow the law and sometimes you have to put the hammer down. But um, I just want to state and you know, look to my colleagues for their reaction or not, that, um, that Ms. Geis's department has always, I think, um, defaulted to the most expansive understanding to protect people's property and keep us from taking it. And to the extent that your department is accused of cutting people slack, this commissioner will never call your department to a counter on the carpet for that. And I just um, want the public to know that that's where this commissioner stands and that my experience with the department has been that they bend over backwards. Uh, they don't have rat traps that are set on a hair trigger just waiting to catch somebody. If you're having a hard time, please come in and talk to Cindy and her department. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that's enough comment on my part. If uh, I think we made a motion, we have a second, so we've got a live one on the table, but uh, Mr. Chairman. We, we do, but I think that was helpful because um, we, we have talked about this, um, but not everyone live streams and people might be paying attention to this particular one. And I will say, I'm trying to, how do I describe myself? Like, I'm not anti-government, but I'm not <coughs> looking to <laughs> look at Leslie's grimace. Um, you are the government. I know, I know. <laughs> it's this weird, like, whoa. Um, but I'll tell you what, I have been shocked at the grace that I've seen come from this county. Get a little emotional thinking about it. Um, and I know not everybody has that experience because they come, you know, deal with somebody different but like I've been like wow I cannot believe that just happened um, in a very positive way for for a homeowner um, and that's not just one one situation so we do try to exercise grace as best we can um, I think we have our, our, our state rep and state senator for our next segment um, where I was gonna say like we're kissing cousins with the state we don't have the same authority um, and maybe we'll talk about that, but we, we've been, as a board, talking to our local delegation at the state level, our D.C. delegation, um, obviously at the federal level. Yeah, this isn't a, a, a conversation that's done. This is the conversation we're having about May 15th, and I get it. And just for full disclosure, A, I'm still raising a family, although I've got one married off. Um, still raising a family, though. I'm a business owner. I have a lease that I'm responsible for. I have, with a business and some family obligations, several, um, that sounds a little more, but a, a handful of property tax statements staring me in the face. So I get this, this is very real. I get from our, our local communities, it's a big deal. Um, and yet in the midst of it, I have this amazing piece, which I think comes from my, not I think, comes from my faith, because I don't know what's gonna happen, but I know it's gonna work out one way or the other. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but it's a good thing. So we are trying to arm wrestle through this. And I also, you know, I didn't really pay attention before the government thing, you know, how I get this, I don't know what camera we're looking at, but I get this Scott County, oh, Scott County, you got the, the letterhead in the upper left, they're after my taxes again. Here's a, a real Scott County property tax. I got one item goes to the, you know, to us, the Scott County, the people of Scott County. One, this happens to be in Belle Plain. One goes to this, a line item goes to the city of Belle Plain. One goes to the school district in Belle Plain that's broken into voter approved levies and other local levies for the school district. Met Council, Mosquito Control, yes. Scott County CDA, uh, Scott County WMO, which is kind of like the watershed, which you know, the cities would, Prior Lake, Spring Lake would see that, a watershed. Um, and then any special assessments. So we get the good fortune of being the collector of those taxes. And a buddy of mine from church said, oh, Mr. Beer is a tax collector. Mm -hmm. Bible story doesn't always look good. <laughs> I said, no, it's, it's different, it's not the same. Um, so our logo's here, but we're collecting, as Leslie said, for a lot of the different jurisdictions. Um, and at the same time, we get it. I mean, this is heart-wrenching. We're trying to, trying to wrestle this thing to ground as best we can with the authority that we have um, and we're this is an open dialogue that we are all having on this board with the folks that 
um, have more authority than we do. And that's not pushing it down the uh, aisle. It's just trying to be transparent in what, what's happening. We feel it. And Mr. Time. Chair, um, with that, I would like to add that not only are we collecting all those taxes for them, and we have distribution dates of those taxes set in law, but uh, with or without the approval of the, of the legislature, because it doesn't say that counties restricted, but some counties are inferring that, restrict, that they're restricted to settle dollars outside of those absolute, this is the statutory deadlines. We've always settled our taxes early. We don't need to settle the full boat to the, to the taxing entities until July 5th, but we try to get everything out by the third week of June, get it all balanced and get it out the doors, which is fairly aggressive. We have one month to make sure that everything is in, in balance. We will come back to you with another resolution, probably in July, early July, asking for you to grant us the authority to settle everything that we've collected through July after those July 15th payments mm -hmm. and make sure that those get settled out to those taxing authorities <laughs> as well. Because like Leslie had alluded to, these folks need that revenue in their piggy bank to pay their staff and keep their operations running just as much as we do. So I will come back with a resolution later on in July to ask for your approval to allow us to do another settlement. Mr. Chairman and colleagues, thank you for letting me pull this and having the discussion. That's Cindy, important. Thank you for the excellent presentation. It's appreciated. So do we have a motion? I gotta, yep, do we have a motion and a second. That was a discussion. Here comes Deb. So that was for a 5.9 that was pulled from consent. So Deb, Mr. Chair, before we do that. Yeah, just, just two more points I, I want to bring up, and, and thank you for bringing this up. I think it was good discussion. I do want to say that I did hear also from the, the chair of the Jordan School Board as they were concerned about this issue that if, if we um, took further action or more aggressive action, it could really hurt them because of their other decreases in revenue. And then second, just some things that have come out in, in my conversation with folks about this issue, just a reminder, um, yeah, we'd probably all like to say, yeah, abate some tax, abate penalties, whatever. We'll cut our budget. There's a lot of things we can't cut. We're in a place where we're mandated. Not only are we collecting for other jurisdictions, and we can't influence what, what they're getting. They get what they get, no matter what we say. Um, there's a lot of, most of what we do, we have to do. It's not up to us to say, oh, we're not going to have a jail or 911 or child protection or any of these things. So I, I think this is a... a as good as I, this is a good thing we've we've done you know a, a good job here and I, we can still keep the ship righted but hopefully give some relief to people and yeah we would love to give it to everybody who's who's hurting now but we have to draw that line somewhere so thank you and if i can say mr yes, chair absolutely. i said it on a number of meetings in the last couple of weeks and particularly the prior lake uh, didn't sit in but just watched it on tv the city council meeting last night the workshop um they were up about 700,000 through last year, I think, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mayor Kirk Briggs is out there. And this year, th things are down already. And so they've already they have some steps on things they're going to cut and replace, not hiring. I saw there's no hiring of part times or summer. I mean, and that affects a lot. So I mean, they're already starting to cut down and do what they can too. So, but it's this tax thing. It's all in motion and it's a tough thing. And there's roads to plow and police. and. And we're okay, wrestling no. through the same things, obviously, at the county level Absolutely. as well. I mean, Everybody it's... is. And I, the townships are the same way. They're like, well, we've only got a few months of reserves. And so... Oh, your mic down. Oh. Yeah, so there's only there's just a few months of reserves on some of these. And some of my township people say, don't extend it, you know, this tax thing here, because people just figure out how to um, uh, spend the money somewhere else. And, you know, some people maybe will do that. But um, I do think it's something we need to do, you know, to... Give, give people a little break here and see if we can't get things righted. So, anyhow, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we have a motion. We have a second on 5.9. Deb, please. Commissioner Weckman Brecky. Aye. Commissioner Wolf. Aye. Commissioner Beard. Aye. Commissioner Beer. Aye. Commissioner Ulrich. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking that time. Um, I think it was a good discussion and it is an open discussion to be sure. All right, we are going to move to 6.1. Uh, we're going to receive an informational update on the operational service plans for county operations during the COVID-19 pandemic and opening of county buildings. 
And Leslie Vermillion is at the podium and we're zooming in on our surveillance report. Just putting that up there real quickly, Mr. Chairman. Um, and when we set this agenda item, we weren't quite sure what we'd even be updating you on as it was kind of in flux at the time. Um, and instead of bringing Lisa and Scott back in since incident command has stood down and there hasn't been a lot of change in their operation, they're still looking at the isolation and quarantine and the tracing things that they're getting trained on for the Department of Health. But this is just an update um, on the numbers in Scott County specifically. Uh, today it'll jump to 76 and 21 hospitalized cases in Scott County. Um, I think when Lisa was here, she said that on 421 we were at 27 cases. So I think as they've ramped up some of the testing, it's begun to show us some more. I think yesterday they completed 10,000 tests, which is a good thing from the federal and state perspective to be able to do these tests to try to help us open up things and know where these hot spots are. So that's a good thing. Now 10,000 um, tests, you mean in Minnesota? Yep, they processed 10,000 wow. tests, she said yesterday. Um, I think the other quick thing was is that all of the cities have some cases. I think about 47% of our cases are in Shakopee, 27 in Savage, 15 in Prior Lake, and then like 3% between New Prague, Elko, Jordan, and Newmarket, all right about the same for those four smaller cities. So that's just a quick update um, on where the county is from two weeks ago. Um, I was here today kind of to update on our facility, depending what happened with the stay at home order. We had closed the building um, through the 4th, and it was to remain closed through then. Um, the governor obviously extended the stay at home order through like midnight on May 17th through, so May 18th. So as of that, and we're using the um, CDC guidance and Here's another one here. So this is the federal, right? The CDC guidance, kind of phase one. They're taking a look at how we can open it up. And of course, as I just did that and I shouldn't have, um, they're taking a look at the employer side of it. Our public health officials in the seven metro county area have been meeting and using the CDC guidance from the federal government and opening up America again, the Minnesota Department of Health, and indeed, <coughs> has some pretty good information also on the state website about opening up businesses and things that we can do. Um, taking a look at our guidance, we have that, that the public health directors is taking a look at, and then our employee relations department, specifically our safety and wellness people, um, Cheryl, our occupational health nurse, um, Kevin, who's in our safety, they're looking at our facility itself from things like um, protective gear, um, putting up the, the glass so that people are, the plexiglass so that people are protected, that we have social distancing marks on the floor, um, those types of things. So we are getting ready for that soft opening on May 18th, assuming that he is going to do those things. But even following the federal guidance, we will continue to encourage teleworking where possible. So it is working in a lot of our areas. Things are going very well right now. Um, so some of the people will continue to work as is. As we bring back people in phases, we're probably going to go to more appointment by appointment. One, it won't have people standing in lines grouping. I think it actually makes our staff and the public's time more efficient if they know they can come in here, have an appointment, and get out. So we are working on that. Um, I think you're going to see those types of things in places like passports, the driver's license, the household hazardous waste site the library computers, the Career Force Center out at the uh, Workforce Center, where we can have folks come in by appointment, meet with the people that they need to see, do their business, leave, and then bring in the next person following good cleaning guidelines and social distancing and the no large gatherings, things like that. It could be possible, and we're checking, that maybe like the household hazardous waste or the libraries with computers could maybe even open before May 18th. I know Jake is working with the library directors Part of the issue with opening up a library is if one county does it, we'll have residents from Dakota and Hennepin and Carver wanting to make appointments. So trying to coordinate some of this so one county isn't overwhelmed is important as we learned earlier in this entire process. So we're doing some of that coordination. The household hazardous waste, I think they've put a very good plan in place um, for moving the gate and locking it down so people that will know it's by appointment 
They'll be able to flip their trunk or their back end. People can remove things. They can pay electronically, so good things can happen there. And we might be able to test that if we're, we're inquiring if we could go ahead and open that service up because we have a plan to be able to do it. Um, the driver's license is a little different issue. Um, we had some rumors that Chaska had opened theirs up. That is not true. That is a state system that is actually locked down. Cindy has contact uh, the Department of Safety or the DMV several times to inquire about that. But anything with face-to-face -face contact still, they're not allowing. So that system is still locked down. So we won't be able to open that up until they allow us to do it. And then again, it would be by appointment only. We'd actually gone to appointment only for passports prior to the shutdown. Mm -hmm. And we were finding, like I said earlier, some success in doing that. Um, places like the jail, the dispatch, the patrol, the highway, their operational service plans that you've already approved, they'll continue to operate under that. Um, the jail, uh, I think Doug and Luke, they should be extremely proud. They actually caught with a temperature, a COVID positive person, isolated them before bringing them into the jail by following all their procedures and protocols, which was a big, big deal mm -hmm. if, since it can spread so quickly within those types of environments. So those types of areas will continue to operate as is. Um, I've said in multiple calls, and I know Pam has been meeting, Pam Selvig with the HHS directors, some of those waivers they've put in place. Um, there are counties right now that are advocating with their legislative delegations to keep some of those waivers permanently in place because they have seen some efficiencies from how they work and do that. So my guess is that'll be a discussion to come um, as well moving forward. And, and Pam will have chances, I believe, to weigh in that with some of her, her groups. So other than that, um, we are continuing to operate. We're following some of those procedures and protocols. We're moving towards the 18th to update those operational service plans. I thought this was kind of an interesting stat. It's Tuesday afternoon that your incident report comes out with all of the data weekly on jail, 911 calls, child protection, adult protection. This is the Tuesday report where we have that. But I thought this was kind of interesting. This is the curbside appointments by the library. And you can see how those have been fairly level, if not even inclining a little bit over <coughs> the weeks as we've opened that up. And just some of the comments about people appreciating that and being able, and, and they come from all the libraries, from New Prague to Prior Lake to Savage to um, Jordan, that people have appreciated being able to have this curbside pickup. Jake told me that I think at Prior Lake and Savage, they are booked out three to four days in advance, and they actually cut the time down so they could actually have more pickups trying to serve more people. So your staff are working creative ways to get things out there to support people. There are people still that have to go out in the field um, and meet with child protection and things like that following the protocols that have been put in place. So with that, I would stand for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Leslie. Great report. And I, I guess from at least this commissioner, maybe this is opening up some discussion, I'm very supportive of as soon as possible and as soon as reasonable that we have reasonable plans in place, we do start to open up some of those services by appointment. If, if allowed before the 18th and we feel we have a safe, good plan in place, let's, let's get back to it because there's no f switch going to be flipped. Mm -hmm. We're probably going to need to be in this new normal for some months, so we might as well get used to working in that way. And so I'm real su very supportive of as soon as departments are ready, as soon as, you know, I know there's some things we're not allowed to open yet, but if we're allowed and a department's ready, has a plan in place, let's get going. If it's not going well, we can reconfigure, but we're not going to know that until right. we, we get open and, and get working. So just throwing that out on the table to see where we're at. Yep. And, and I think household hazardous waste might be that example. I think <laughs> right. Kate and that group has put a plan yeah. in place. Um, we're hearing some concerns from ditches again yep. and oh townships. Yeah. And so if we can get the go ahead to open that and it doesn't violate something with the stay at home order, um, we would begin then probably to slowly open that one up to by appointment only. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, Leslie, thank you, Ms. Chair. Leslie, the um, testing protocol. We 17 new reported infections. Does that mean people who are sick or people who have been tested and they have antibodies 
That's the first part of my question. Um, and I'm not the expert, but according to Lisa, this is people that are sick. So this is the yeah. testing we're doing that people wanted to be tested to find out if they were sick or not. So it's new cases. Yep. So you're kind of answering the second part of my question then is we're still not doing random sampling of the population. We, the state, is not doing random sampling yet. We're, we're just testing people who present and who say, I think I'm sick. That is my understanding, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? HHW was exactly the one I was thinking about, being a, trying something new and being willing to adapt and change. And I think other many other departments are doing the same thing. So, so the people who want to dump on my dirt road can make an appointment. See, now. that's <laughs> yeah. It, it all hits close to home, doesn't it? Maybe we can have somebody waiting for them if we make them make an appointment. Oh boy. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. No, I know. Mr. Sometimes you yeah. hope, hope you don't catch somebody, right? Yeah. Read about you in the paper. I, I think we just should make a reminder to everyone who's watching that, that uh, except for the very few things that cannot or are not allowed to operate right now, things are operating. Use the website, call the county, staff will walk you through how mm -hmm. we can help with a title transfer with a eligibility um, application, any of that. We, we are here and it's different, but we're here to help get it done. Yes, um, we've had folks show up at the door and our staff will go out and stand and explain to somebody a title transfer, how to use the box. They are answering those types of phone calls. Um, so yeah, we're still here to do those things. The ones we can't do right now are a driver's license, um, people can do passports by mail-in. They have to get a picture like at a Walgreens or someplace, but you can actually mail those types of things in. You don't have to do it in person. Um, it's the driver's license that is the big one. We're still mm -hmm. doing the tabs, the titles, the marriage, the death certificates, birth certificates. And in fact, land records is actually exceeding their 2019 numbers with all of the, um, I'm guessing, refinancing and things going mm -hmm. on in the housing market currently. Um, and so, you know, Michael had last reported the housing market was still pretty strong. I believe in the last 30 days it started to level off now a little bit as we're working our way into this. But, um, yeah, we're still here. They're still cleaning roads. They are still working on construction projects. I would think with this little bit of rain and good weather, they should be making good progress on all three yeah. of those major projects going on. Um, people are out cleaning and maintaining the roadways. Like I said, I, we, I talked to a child protection worker the other day that had to go out in the field. They follow their protocol. So we are still working. And I think it stands to point out one more time what Commissioner Wickman Brecky brought up that, because I had this come up with titles and tabs. I think it was titles specifically dropped in the box. Something wasn't quite right. I had to wait to get it back, send it back in to call, hit her website, call the phone number, walk through some of that stuff. I'm looking at Cindy, we're, that's what we're doing, yep. Um, to try to get that stuff right so you don't have to get, wait for it in the mail and all that stuff. So good point, thank you for bringing that up. And it also has the other resources if people need them that have been really harmed by the pandemic for food, for support, for those types of things. That information is on our website as well. Good reminder, a lot of good, good things going on in the community in the midst of craziness. All right, any other? Questions? I know we can take another bite at the apple at the end here, but all right. With that being said, let's move to 6.2. Um, we're going to receive an informational update from Representative Brad Tapke and Senator Eric Pratt. Thank you for hanging on Skype. Are we going to be able to see folks at home? Will be able to see that on this? We think. Oh, they'll be able to hear it. Okay, I won't necessarily be able to see it. Brad and Eric, are you out there? See him on the side. I don't see. Mic, oh yeah. Is there, do we need to unmute that? There's some beeping. What is that beeping? It's the mic, I think. Yeah. Do we need to do that as the presenter to unmike to uh, unmute their oh, mics? There's Brad. There. Yep. S Senator <laughs> Pratt, we still have you on mute. Yep. Senator Pratt needs to unmute yet. in case I can't do can we do that here Jason? I don't think we can do it he has to do it we can't hear you so let me send a do you have audio for me we can hear you Brad hello ah, good um, 
just going to send a quick text to him. That? Yes. Oh, you're doing it? Just okay. in case, just in case. <laughs> I know. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah. So assuming he can hear at least, because maybe we just monitoring the screen to see what is muted and not. Getting there. I think we're getting there. Are you doing the BP thing? I thought that nope. was you. No, it there. wasn't. Thank you for your patience, folks, as we try to get our senator and rep. Uh oh, he's, he's saying he can't see unmute. Hmm. Maybe we can unmute him. He just joined. Are you on my phone, Senator Pratt? I am. Can you there he is. Oh, there he is. All right, so we've got him on audio, which is, I guess, what we have uh, Representative Tapke on as well. So, Representative Tapke and Senator Pratt, are you with us? Good morning. Thanks for having us. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I appreciate your willingness to come in and give us an update. The floor is yours. Thanks. I'll, uh, I'm listening to the ad committee hearing that I'm in currently in my left ear and uh, <laughs> talking to you guys as well. So, it's... Uh, going to be one of those days, but thank you uh, so much for having us. Just wanted to check in with uh, Stack Ag Commissioners. Thanks for all of your work that you uh, all have been doing on behalf of uh, my district and all Shakopee residents, and uh, it's just been a lot of things going on. I've been handling it really, really well, so I've been um, working closely on a lot of things with uh, Cindy and Julie in the Deputy Registrar's pieces and the transportation stuff uh, that I've been handling from the state side, but mostly just wanted to check in and uh, there's obviously a lot of things going on and just wanted to an have a chance to answer any questions that you have and uh, just be that conduit to what's going on in the House of Representatives and at the state as best as we can. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Brad, this is Commissioner Beard. Um, it's noon today that we get the new budget update. Is that right? That's what I understand. Yes. We meaning the state, the state out, state's outlook. Okay. Yeah, you know, the state is doing. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I just realized that we're in uh, a committee meeting, so in a meeting, so I should uh, be going through the chair. So sorry about that, uh, Commissioner Beard. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. All good. Yeah, yeah. We, we, so, hey, we, we go uh, by um, Bobby's rules, not Robert's rules, so <laughs> go for it. All right, got it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so Commissioner Beard and uh, Commissioner Beard, I, uh, yes, we have a new uh, an update that's coming out today, and we don't really know uh, a ton about what, how inclusive and how, uh, what the breadth of that update will be. Uh, but basically, it's just going to give us a good guideline and some guidance as to what we need to do for the rest of the current biennium and uh, what we're looking at for the future. And so that'll give us, we obviously started this uh, session with a uh, surplus that we had some big plans for and what uh, <laughs> we wanted to do to help Minnesotans. Um, but uh, obviously, that is all out the window. And so today should hopefully give us a better understanding of where we're at and where we're going. Good. Thank you. I actually. Senator Pratt, anything you want to intro us on? Well, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Beer and, and commissioners. Um, I finally figured out how to work Skype here, so thank you. This is my first Skype meeting. Um, you know, really, the Senate is focused on working with the governor to get through the COVID-19 crisis as quickly as possible. Uh, we just passed a, a tax package that includes provisions to help our Main Street businesses who have been impacted by the crisis with their cash flow. So for example, we would delay estimated uh, state income tax, we would uh, delay the accelerated payment of sales tax, and we would delay the payment of the general statewide business property tax. We also wanted to focus on growth. So uh, in our tax bill, we have section 190, or 179 conformity to the federal tax code. And that allows our small businesses, and, and quite honestly, a lot of it is used by farmers, 
to deduct large equipment purchases. We eliminated the sunset on the ANGEL investment tax credit so that we can keep capital flowing to our startups. And we wanted to clarify and make all the payroll protection plan loans or PPP loans forgivable, or the money that is forgivable, make sure it's not taxable. And then for our communities, we included a fair school equalization aid formula. We wanted to lower the property tax rate for low-income housing, and we wanted to make sure that we gave tax relief to charitable gaming once they reopened so that community groups could keep more of their fundraising. In addition to that, I'm working with small business. I'm working on a small business funding program. We're hoping to use the federal funds to help businesses that were impacted by the executive order. My guess is that will be somewhere between $30 and $50 million, and some or all of it will be forgivable. And we're really trying to target the funds to the really small businesses, those with 10 or fewer employees. I also worked on passing some work comp presumption for our frontline workers so that if they get sick, they can be somewhat confident. If they get sick from COVID on the job, they can be confident that they can be covered through workers' compensation. Now we're looking at the financial impact to cities, counties, and hospitals and trying to work through that. We are working on a bonding bill to help stimulate the economy. The focus in the Senate will be more on common infrastructure. Additionally, the state received just short of $2 billion in federal aid, and we believe the legislature should have some oversight in working with the governor to allocate the funds. As Commissioner Beard asked and Representative Taffey said, we have a budget update at noon where I expect, quite honestly, the projections to show a multi-billion dollar deficit. And I heard a little bit earlier in the meeting talking about Prior Lake and that we've been talking to businesses in Jordan, Shakopee, Prior Lake, and other communities around the state. And some of our small businesses have laid out some really detailed plans on how they can be reopened safely for their customers and their employees. I've been helping these small businesses get in contact with the Department of Employment and Economic Development, which is leading the effort on behalf of the governor and making sure that these plans get to the governor so that we can help these small businesses survive the crisis. As I said yesterday, we've bent the curve on the health care crisis. Now we need to work on bending the curve on the economic crisis. Thank you. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll stand for questions. Well, thank you for your good work, both of you. And I just wanted to say, because you two, along with Tony Albright, are the representatives and senators that I work with, and I know we all do. And I just appreciate both and Tony, so the three of you, your willingness to pick up the phone and respond to a text and an email and be responsive to the many questions and needs we have at the county. So I just wanted to thank you both and Tony Albright as well, who's not on this call at this time. So with that, I'm going to look left and right. We have a question coming from Commissioner Beard. Well, gentlemen, Senator, Representative, can you give us just a brief update on what actually has to pass by May 18th? I know the bonding bill is traditional, and there's a lot of good stuff going on with that. Anything else that absolutely must have to pass by the 18th, or are we waiting now for the bonding chairs to do their dance? Mr. Chair and Commissioner Beard, certainly the bonding bill is the highlight of the entire session, as you know. Everybody, we go into this session saying it's the bonding year. And I think more than ever before, the bonding program is, or the bonding bill is going to be really, really important for re-stimulating our economy and making sure that 
are helping to make sure that this is a V-shaped recession rather than a long, drawn-out recession. And I don't mean to speak for the House, Brad, but I do know that both the House and the Senate are very, very interested in stimulus packages as well, making sure that we help stimulate and save our small businesses. We tend to take a little bit different approach, and hopefully we can work through those differences and get these passed before we go signing die on the 18th. Yeah, I would say this is probably one curve we don't want to flatten. We'd like it to be short and steep if it's got to be. Right. Don't be dragging that out. I'm sorry, Brad. Go ahead. Representative. No, I agree with Senator Pratt there. Those are some of the main things that we are working on. The bonding, so we've got the Marion Junction project for Scott County that we are working really hard to get included in the bonding project because we need to use this bonding bill as a way to make sure Minnesotans stay employed and busy and that there's a lot of work flowing to really improve everyone's lives on a statewide, regional, local level. So that's really important that we get that done. Some sand was thrown in the gears over the weekend, so hopefully we can work on those and get those pieces figured out so that we can move forward with everything. But other pieces that we, like the House just yesterday, we passed an elections bill to help make sure that we are getting the federal money in the places it needs to so that Cindy can run her shop and make sure elections are secure and safe and get that piece done. So that passed yesterday, so that was a really big piece on the House side of it. And then some local things that I think are a must-have is that the Senate has passed a bill to help Valley Fair, so we're helping local businesses as well with who they can hire and what ages can work on the rides, and we are on our way to passing that on the House floor as well. And so then we're also working really hard on a bill and working together with the SMSC and with many other entities for Minnesota Racing Commission to make sure that racing makes sense at Canterbury Park for this summer and fixing some technical issues that way. So that's another must-have on a local level from our perspective. So we're working on those things, and I couldn't be prouder of how well everyone is working together. There are obviously different political infighting and different things like that that happen with things, but overall everyone has been extraordinary in working to get the things that have to get done done for all of us. So it's a really good thing. Commissioner Beer, I would just state to you and the entire county staff, we're at the stage of passing these laws, but oftentimes it falls on you to execute them and really have the hands-on with the residents of Scott County. And so teamwork is so important, and we appreciate your participation, your engagement, your partnership in this as we work through all these different issues. So I don't know if you were on earlier, so was my assessment fair that the county and the state were kissing cousins? Is that a fair assessment? It's not what I want, Commissioner Beer, but I would say that's a pretty accurate description. Well, you know, it captures the relationship and that little bit of cringe. Exactly. Right, sound bites. Yeah, well, who knows where that will show up again. But, yeah, continue to do the good work. And, yes, I appreciate the realization, and I know you both know that a lot of that stuff does fall on our staff and to try to implement and execute some of these things. So please be gracious as best you can. Mr. Chair, if I could ask a question. Absolutely. Yeah, I have a question about the election bill. Was there anything about mail-in voting in that bill? I'm concerned, you know, we have absentee voting for all, which is great. It's a good system. I'm concerned with the debate that's going on, you know, in the country about mail-in voting, and the opportunity for abuse is quite significant. And I would think I oppose mail-in voting, but I'm just wondering what's the state of the debate on that in our state, and was there anything on that in the election bill? I'll take that one, Chair. Thank you. So, Chair Beer and Commissioner Ulrichs, so in the House bill that we passed yesterday, there was nothing in there for mail 
in voting. So we're working really hard on the, as these bills come to the floor to having pre-agreement with the Senate on getting things done. Uh, that was something that was not able to be agreed to. We in the House um, actually really wanted to have that in. There's there's very little evidence that uh, mail-in balloting is uh, it's done is uh, rife with issues and that kind of thing. There are very much um, uh, it's done extremely successfully in Minnesota right now. There are many many people in Minnesota that vote by by mail-in ballot. Uh, and many other states do it highly successfully as well. So I think there's potential to make sure that we have a really safe and um, uh, thorough election so that people can, all, all people can vote. And uh, so I, I think that would have been a good thing to include personally, but it, it was not included. And I do not think that's something we can come to agreement on and get uh, figured out for this session. All right, I'm looking to my left and my right. I know uh, we only have two ears and can only listen to two meetings, so is there any other <laughs> questions at this particular point in time? I know, again, I want to thank you guys for um, answering your phones and texts so I know we can get a hold of you with other things. Um, any last comments from the board? I'm glad they're there and not me. <laughs> <laughs> can I just ask, Mr. Chair, um, Senator Pratt, you had mentioned uh, there'd be a billions of dollars. <clears throat> what do you think? Are you hearing some numbers, or, or was that a guess, or was that something floating around there? Or what do you think it's going to be, the number? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I, I don't know. What, I, I've, heard, I've heard a range of numbers, uh, anywhere from, you know, hundreds of millions to, you know, tens of billions. You know, I, I don't know. I'm just speculating that it's going to be a multi-billion dollar debt. It's going to be more. I, my guess is it's going to be more than a billion. I don't know how much more. Um, but that's, I, you know, my, my dad always told me, plan for the worst, and then you're always pleasantly surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, before we let you uh, to go, um, we are going to be discussing another item that I think one or both of you maybe know that I have an intent to send a letter to the governor um, in support of Prior Lake's plan to want to open some businesses. So I just, if you didn't, weren't aware of that, be aware of it in case I need you to hand deliver something. Just as an FYI. Right, thank you. And with that. Unfortunately, I have to go to another committee meeting. Yep. But, uh, nope, for sure. Happy to, happy to discuss it with any and all of you as we, as we move along. Thank you for your willingness, both of you. With that, keep up the good fight. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for having us. I appreciate it. And if you and anybody needs to, uh, I think you all have my phone number, but as well, all any constituents and people, uh, the best way to get in touch and to stay in touch right now with, at least for me, is email. And so uh, email is the best way to track things. And there are lots of folks who have unemployment insurance questions and all sorts of business questions and that kind of stuff. Anything that's state level, uh, please send them. Our direction will help everyone as best as we possibly can. Thank you very much. Make the most of it. We appreciate it. All right. We are going to move on to 6.3. We're uh, consider sending a letter to Governor Walls regarding small businesses and Administrator Vermillion is at the podium. Mr. Chairman and uh, Commissioners, this was our uh, second add-on item today. Things seem to change fast during all of this COVID-19. Yes, indeed. Um, the Chairman asked that we prepare a letter um, and then he put his own kind of personal touches on it to support the City of Prior Lakes letters that went to the Governor regarding the opening of restaurants and small businesses in um, Prior Lake. So you have a copy of that letter, I think, that you were provided um, to take a look at and review. So we're here for direction um, today to send this letter to the board on behalf of either the Board of Commissioners or from the chairman himself, or if all four or five of you would like to sign on to the letter, we're looking for that direction today and how you would like to handle that. And if this letter is um, at the point um, that you are all comfortable with and sends the right message. And just, uh, well, literally for the record, the intent was here is like, I really feel like we have really good chemistry as a board and I just wanted everyone to be aware um, that this was my intention and to 
yeah, just kind of say, hey, this is kind of my convictions, um, supporting town in my um, district, but it's bigger than that, and just to let the chips fall where they may. Mr. Chair, and, um, yesterday when I first uh, saw this, I thought this was a great idea, great add-on here, and I see um, Mayor Kurt Briggs out there and Council Member Annette Thompson out there. Thank you for sitting through this whole thing. Um, I just, it, my opinion is we got to open some of these things up. We're going to start losing people, and I'm, I know, Mayor, you're hearing this because I'm hearing a ton from people, calls you know, where people don't even want to do, have uh, uh, township roads done that need maintaining because the assessments will throw some people over the edge. And uh, um, it's tough out there, and it's a lot tougher if your business is not even be able to be open. And this isn't just a prior lake thing. This is the United States world thing here. So whatever we can do to help facilitate that, I, I think we got to do it. So Well, and this letter will be in the record, obviously, yep. be online so people have access to it. And, and this this was an attempt, like I kind of, kind of pray through it, mull over it for a few days. Um, the intent is not to uh, thumb the nose at the medical community. It's to, hey, awesome job. We've got to keep that up. Mm -hmm. But we're to the point to where we can't keep people um, sequestered without the economy rolling. And when I say the economy, I'm not talking about just the dollars. That's a big piece of it, but it's, it's not the biggest piece of it. Um, the idea of taking away a livelihood and what that does to the soul of a person is um, that to me is a bigger issue than the actual dollars, which are huge. Um, so it was it was to just to request of the governor to um, consider opening Prior Lake as a plan and um, to open up some businesses safely, smartly, not just I'm not looking to open, 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 open. I'm saying let's smartly open with a plan. Let's, we got, we got to start dipping some toes in. We have to start fighting this thing on two tracks. One, with the medical community. One, we need to learn to live while we fight this thing. Um, that was my heart in writing this letter. Um, I know it's a little bit long. I hope it gets read. Um, so just a little back story on where I was coming from. Um, and then drove around Lowe's and Home Depot and Target and uh, ended at Ace. Uh, like, things are open. People are bumming shoulders. There's things going on. Catch it there, right? Supposedly, you yeah. Catch it allegedly, there. allegedly. You can only catch it at church, apparently. So <laughs> we do have the mayor, as was pointed out. We do have a council member uh, from Prior Lake. Um, and restaurants. Like, I'm certainly willing, to, if you want to address, uh, to have that kind of discretion. But we need you to come up so we can get you on the microphone, if, if need be. And i um, um, happy to do that. Um, Chairman Beer, commissioners, um, I want to, uh, I want to uh, first thank you for the initiative and your support of this letter. Um, quite honestly, I was taken aback by Commissioner Beard's wonderful statements in regards to what government can and cannot do, and that of compassion. And um, I want to tell you, in this quote-unquote fluid situation, there are some things that are not fluid. Um, <laughs> There are spreadsheets and there's real economic impact um, that right now is going to be taking many, many of our small businesses. The virus is not an equitable, fair um, virus in terms of whom it impacts. Right now, it is singling out our small businesses. I sent a couple of text messages this morning saying that, um, quite honestly, our small businesses are on a bit of an economic death march. And they are deserving of a date certain when they can open. There have been two extensions on the governor's orders. Um, and not only do I respect the actions the governor took, and I want to say that at the core of this is safety. Um, we've received uh, many communications from our citizens that are upset with the action of this council. This council voted 5-0 to request the governor under safe conditions open restaurants, and this council voted 4-1 with safe, self-imposed conditions of our boutiques to open. Two separate letters, 4-1 on the boutiques and shops, 5-0 on the restaurants. In both of those communications, community safety was at the top of the list. If you are in an at-risk group, please do not come. 
But right now, um, I have had discussions. There is one restaurant that right now has a big for sale sign on it in Prior Lake. Um, I did have a discussion with the boutique owner whose intention is um, if this extends to liquidate. So um, I've had an opportunity to read your draft letter. I'm, I'm very appreciative. Um, if there are two things that you might be open to relative to the letter, um, we, the Prior Lake City Council, passed a motion last night um, requesting that staff do send another letter to the governor. We're looking for an answer to our questions. Our letters are now two weeks old. Um, and we did have a nice meeting with Commissioner Grove, Commissioner Lepic, Representative Albright, Senator Pratt, last Friday. Um, of course, that was the day following the governor's extension. So our letter that we asked for is, Governor, please tell us. And we're asking for a date certain. And that date certain provides for something that these businesses need. That's an opportunity to plan. It's also an opportunity for them to make some decisions. Because for them, some of these loans that they've received, it's a matter of, do they stretch this out? These resources are coming to an all too clear conclusion. And not knowing the date puts them on this economic death march where they don't know, they can't plan. We need to give them that clarity. So um, date certain, and then I'd encourage you to include um, our legislators, um, our state legislators who have been most supportive of our efforts, but above all else, I can't thank you enough for picking this one up, uh, taking this one on, and your support, as you said, Chair, is, is not uh, just the city of Prior Lake. This is for all small businesses mm -hmm. across the state. And uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, and I just point out that, that this was based on a couple of letters that had plans attached to them. This wasn't willy-nilly, hey, we want to open up at all costs. This is an, we want to open up and here's what we, I think it was two or three pages of bullet points of things of, that will happen. So it is not a, um, a rush to open. It's, it's a push to allow choice for people to show up or not show up with. People are gonna show up where they feel safe. Um, in those conditions, um, that's what gave me um, a level of uh, comfort that this, A, I, have, I know you guys have your heart and soul into this. Those businesses have come together uh, to ratify some of these uh, guidance points and that's a really big deal. So it's not thumbing the nose at anybody, um, anyone, healthcare industry or whatever, it's a, uh, yes, we need to keep fighting this and get better at that. And we also need to begin to dip our toes back in to uh, create livelihoods because everything's linked together. Everything's linked together. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a, a great letter and, and I'm not, I'm, I don't think we have action necessarily in front of us because it's a letter from from you, but it, I think this is a good discussion because I know other communities in Scott County are looking at something similar um, where, where we can represent our district by, by sending a similar letter or supporting if we, we feel they meet that criteria. But you, you really hit the nail on the head for me. We're not saying just reopen. Mm -mm. We're saying in cases, much like we're talking about with our county operations, is if there's a safe way to do it, if we're taking into account all the parameters of what's going on, let's let's start and try it because again, it's not a switch. It's not like everything's just mm -hmm. gonna be open with no restrictions. So learning and being able to do this in controlled environments and, and I really applaud the business owners. Prior Lake, it, it's a, a nice place to consider this because there's some geographic parameters. There, there is, it's very different than some other locations. But I think at our last meeting, um, even publicly, we were talking about how is it that you can go buy shirts at Target but not at Bill's Toggery. So, so I think this this board is considered, you know, can, um, can worried about the equity with our small businesses, and and not that it's in our jurisdiction, but that we can lend some to support when there are reasonable plans in place, knowing that. The business community, just like the county, will need to adapt if things change or um, get worse. So uh, I'm not sure that we're taking action or that you're asking for action of just that, yes, 
No what, one has a problem with the letter? We're looking for direction. And if you're comfortable and do you want more than the chairman to sign it? Do all five of you want to sign the letter? I'm okay. Mr. Chair, if I could uh, comment, um, I would like to sign on to the letter. I, I think it would be a good thing if, if all of our commissioners were to sign on to the letter. Mm -hmm. And I support the sentiments in the letter that I think we need to sa start safely opening up uh, our businesses, you know, restaurants, and retails, and so forth as much as possible. I do feel a little um, anguish for the, more than a little, I feel anguish for the businesses you know, when they open, it's not going to be the old reality. It's, it's. Um, I, you know, I was talking to my wife about this. I said it's going to be a couple of years before a restaurant that you go into a restaurant and they say, well, it's a 45 minute wait. Uh, you know, we're full. You know, but we can get you in in 45 minutes. I think we're a couple of years away from that for sure. That when these restaurants open up or whatever, they're going to be less capacity. I think there's a new reality where. Retail and businesses, all types, are going to have to find a way to market their um, retail business or whatever it is in a different way so that people can buy uh, without coming in and um, or get the takeout. Some some restaurants have been much more aggressive in offering their uh, takeout menu, and, and I just think there's a new reality. And maybe there's a way we should, through scale or, or workforce, uh, development board or whatever, how to market in this new reality, you know, after this virus or whatever, you know, facing this virus for a couple of years. So I think they're, I support everything in the letter, but I think we need to, everybody's got to think about how to, how to what's the new reality going to look like and, and uh, market in a different way. I definitely think we're going to be in a new reality and this just gives the choice to kind of explore that for sure. Um, so maybe we add a line that says with support of whoever wants to sign? Correct, we'll just um, change it to, it, it's respectfully, it'll be from all five of you. <coughs> Commissioner Ulrichs, we will do um, remotely here. And the other four of you should be able to sign it by the end of the work session. Good deal. Yeah. And we, yeah. I, I like that, but I don't like to take away the, this is a very personal letter written from the mm. chair. So I think if there's a way we can sign on that yep. we support it versus I don't want to have right. to change your right. personal message that's, here. That's what I was thinking if we did a, just a line on the bottom that says sent with support. Right, or, or sent however, if that's okay, we that we're not it. changing that yep. into we this and then we have to get into right, it. Right, right, yes. Um, but then, and I, I don't know that this has to be action because it seems like we have fairly unanimous agreement or consensus on this. Um, if other communities in Scott County develop similar plans where they've created a plan, not just mm -hmm. send a letter for us too, but are we willing to do the same thing and can we do that in a timely manner? My answer is yes, and I tried to put a line in there that said, and other areas. I, mm -hmm. I just happened to be looking at Prior Lake because they had the letter and the guidance behind it. It was, that that was the important piece. I, I um, that is a very important piece, so I absolutely yeah. agree with that. And I just asked because I know Jordan City Council was at least considering something similar and um, working with their businesses. So and maybe a I scale asked. community would be open to sharing that possible template with another scale community. Perhaps, perhaps, yes. All right, so the direction is if another city comes forward with a plan and their businesses have a plan in place for safely opening and that documented, we'd be willing to put a letter together for that commissioner in support of the other four, is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, I think with, the, right. with the, that kind of extensive guidance and safety, uh, yes, I, I'm in. Right. We're just acknowledging support. Yes. Correct. For good or bad, we don't make that decision, I guess. <laughs> well, it gives choice. People can show or not. Thank you. Oh, One more Mr. question? Chair, uh, no, just a comment. Um, uh, appreciation for the tone of your letter. Um, it's, um, it's the last two weeks over there. Um, as uh, former mayor and representative Dan McElroy said, uh, uh, at least in City Hall, they bowled underhanded and used one ball at a time. In St. Paul, they use many balls and they throw hard high ones. Um, so they're in a very uh, partisan and uh, can get kind of testing acrimonious. This letter is not that. And thank you for not participating in that. And thank you for uh, setting a, a high tone. It's appreciated. I'm honored to sign on in any fashion you think would be helpful. 
this is a great idea. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. Thank you. All right, with that, we are going to move to item number seven, committee reports and commissioner updates. I'm going to look to my right to Commissioner Weckenbrecken. Thank you. Um, April 21st, the date of our last meeting, just a reminder, we did have a workshop after that meeting where we discussed County Road 83 and then the property tax penalty issue. Um, just wanted to state that publicly because I don't, that was discussed during our workshop, so it wasn't True. Um, streamed, right. it was open to the public, but if people wonder where that discussion happened, it did happen in a hosted, open to the public um, arena. On Wednesday, April 22nd, um, I, it's hard, weird to say attended, I participated in, there we go, participated in the NACO Human Services and Education Steering Committee conference call um, with our colleagues from across the country. A lot of discussion there on um, waivers uh, for federally uh, mandated human <coughs> services uh, type services that we have to provide. Uh, Monday, April 27th, um, there was a webinar with the governor with AMC and our colleagues around the state, uh, just getting updates, hearing, hearing from him. Uh, several commissioners asked questions, talked about some of these issues that we've already been talking about today. Um, also on that day, I had the governing board meeting for um, Minnesota Alliance for Healthy Families. That's our um, multi-jurisdiction group providing home visiting uh, to families in Scott County. So that was our regular governing board meeting held over Zoom. And then later that day, the AMC um, Health and Human Services Policy Committee meeting where both commissioners of health and human services also attended, uh, updated us on what's going on in their departments. Um, county commissioners uh, provided feedback, mostly talked on, on those human services waivers that are allowing us to do more of the work we're mandated to do without being in person. Uh, Thursday, April 30th, had a conference call with um, Senator Pratt and Representative Tapke and Commissioner Beard and a few others from the Shakopee area, just updating on things that were going on, hearing about um, online learning with the school district uh, and how that was going. Later that day had a SHAC briefing call, um, statewide community health organization and then that evening I participated in the City of Jordan Jordan Commercial Club Zoom meeting heard from a lot of the business owners there about uh, about the difficulties um, heard from one business owner who things are going really well he was able to adapt and to a restaurant and is doing just great great business so I think we have to realize mm -hmm. that there too that there's there's learnings from some of these businesses who he actually said he hired more staff to um, take out and delivery has, has just been that tremendous. And, and so um, we want to applaud that too and really encourage people to be looking at that. And I think it wouldn't be fair if we didn't bring up that every now and then there's a business owner who tells us that. But um, mm -hmm. that's also where we heard from the Jordan School District about their <coughs> concerns on the property taxes. Friday, May 1st, um, participate in the Minnesota Housing Partnership weekly call. Um, I talked a bit about uh, local governments and counties and how they're dealing with housing. Uh, so much of, of the group, people on that call, there's about 150 deal with you know either very urban issues or very rural issues. So I wanted to hear what, what's it like in Scott County. Um, and then on Monday, May 4th, had MELSA Finance Committee meeting to review the auditor's report. Um, other than those meetings, uh, as Commissioner Beer said earlier, we've been um, working with Angie Craig's staff and um, signing on to a bipartisan letter, um, trying to make sure that the COVID relief bills take into account counties and cities like ours. So far, so much of the relief to local governments has been for um, counties or cities over 500,000 people, population. Uh, obviously, we're all having a lot of costs and, and um, impact from COVID too, so working hard to make sure that Congress is including smaller counties and cities in, in the next relief bill. And then finally, just wanted to um, call a little bit of attention to um, something that was on the consent agenda, the resolution to approve some middle of the bill grant for the um, interchange in Jordan and the frontage roads in Sand Creek Township. Uh, again, really, even though we're dealing with this immediate mm -hmm. crisis and day-to-day -day work, really thinking and looking at the years ahead about what has to be done. That work um, can't stop, and so I applaud staff for 
getting that done and submitted in, in tough, busy times here. That's the end of my report. Thank you very much. I'm going to look all the way down to my left. Commissioner Beer, and then we'll come to Commissioner Ulrich right after that. Sure, you're looking over here at the left wing of your... Exactly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> on stage right, though. Uh, yes. On the uh, 22nd, I'm appreciative that uh, Commissioner Wolf reminded me we had a Mosquito Control District uh, <laughs> Zoom meeting, uh, which I was able to participate in. Thank you, Commissioner Wolf. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the 28th, um, the CAP Agency Finance Committee met and um, uh, participated there. Uh, they're having some uh, issues, uh, not with, um, I think the donations are actually up and the food shelf usage is up, but um, uh, still uh, transi transitioning from one finance uh, software, set of software to another, trying to account for the way their money comes in and goes out because it's grants. And in effect, they do the work and then apply for a reimbursement from the grant kind of thing. Um, uh, we had a long discussion about the way their P&L looks. It's nothing like you'd ever seen if you run a business. So yes. anyhow, I uh, uh, really appreciate this new CFO, Molly Telejohn. She is a fantastic uh, talent and a great team player, and she's helping educate the board members on why this looks so odd and why she's going to make it understandable. So good stuff. Uh, later that afternoon, the Shakopee Chamber sponsored a Zoom conference with um, uh, Mayor Bill Mars and City Administrator Bill Reynolds. Uh, a little Q&A kind of forum, an update on how the city of Shakopee was handling this uh, current uh, pandemic with the Wuhan virus going around. So uh, that was uh, it was a good meeting. On the 29th, um, I was privileged to speak in front of the Senate Bonding Committee. Uh, they had a Zoom meeting also. I'm noticing a lot of Zoom, which I've gotten pretty good at using and tends to work rather well. I think uh, Zoom is probably eating Skype's breakfast right now. It's just oh by the way, but a meeting there where I was asked to speak on behalf of several of the multi-county uh, rail authorities that I work with around the state um, on the Senate bonding bill and the, and the opportunity we have at this moment uh, in in uh, at this moment in our political history to actually do a lot of really useful work with infrastructure, uh, sewer, water, roads, bridges, airports. Uh, shoreline railroads in particular. It was an uh, honor to be asked and, uh, and a great committee participation, a good bipartisan response. That was good. Uh, let's see, and on the 20th, 30th, uh, there was a uh, conference call. Um, uh, I think uh, Commissioner Brecky just referenced it with uh, Senator Pratt, Representative Albright, Representative Tabke, and several others of us, uh, just kind of staying in touch on a, uh, a, le a level. Um, I think he calls it the Scott County Leadership Team, but all of you are part of that team, but I think open meeting laws mean only two of us can participate. So I was uh, uh, glad to sit in on part of that meeting. That's my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Commissioner Ulrich. Yes, uh, on the uh, 28th, I attended the chair vice chair meeting. One item out of that has already been mentioned, but I wanted to say I was impressed with the household hazardous waste plan for reopening the appointment uh, method. Uh, I think that'll be good. It, it, it will make it so people don't have to wait in long lines or that the lines stack out in the road and can be an unsafe uh, procedure. So I, I was really impressed with uh, their proposal and I, I think they're tracking to open as soon as they can, you know, as soon as they're allowed. And I think they, they'll, they'll do a good job with that. On the 29th, the uh, Minnesota Valley Transit Authority board meeting. I'm, I'm impressed with uh, their approach to the virus and all the measures they're taking. They're, they're sanitizing the buses. Obviously, that would be expected, but they're also spraying a second stage, which is beyond the, the CDC guidelines. They're spraying the, the buses with a fogger, and the, um, yeah. the material sits on the buses, inside the buses, for a 10 minute period where it dries and then evaporates and it kills virtually everything, any virus that's in the bus, that's good. They're changing the filters every day. They're moving paper products. They're limiting the amount of people that can be on the buses and they're, they're blocking off seats. So there's distancing there. And there's a, there's a plastic barrier between the, the public and the driver. It, yeah, I'm looking at a picture of it right now. It, it looks kind of like a, a shower curtain that's, uh, extended tight. It was only $25 per bus to, mm. to put this plastic barrier up, but it's a good thing. The only thing that I wish is that, I don't know if, if MBT or MBTA or our um, 
uh, Smart Link and Transit Link are, are you acquiring passengers to wear a mask? Mm -hmm. I think I think that would be key. I, I learned actually from the health department um, and a call that I was able to listen in on that uh, people are contagious 48 hours before they show any symptoms at all. And that's really the danger with this virus is that, you know, you say I'm sick or I've got a fever or a cough, dry cough, or I've got aches. And those are all symptoms, but you're contagious before any of those show up. So having masks, I, I think their Costco is going to, uh, shoppers have masks and mm -hmm. there's been a little uh, pushback uh, members of the public about for, towards Costco for doing that. I think, um, you know, it's, it's a reasonable request for to wear masks uh, when you're gathering with large amounts of people. And so that's good. May 1st, the scale executive committee. Um, one thing I want to call out there is uh, we had a discussion about broadband services and it was really a follow up to what we've done with the, the money that we 35,000 uh, each, the three way split between the townships and the, uh, the vendor for 105,000 for a tower. Apparently there was one, Township that asked, they weren't named, but they were asked uh, if, if scale would contribute to that um, that endeavor. And, and I said, well, you know, that's kind of like asking the county con to contribute twice uh, because half the money from scale comes from the county. And and there was a little bit of discussion, and it was clarified, and I think a good clarification that scale revenue should not be used for infrastructure really at any time. We really have never done that. And so I think it was kind of marked out that, that that wouldn't be something that would uh, be allowed uh, in the future to use scale revenues for infrastructure. You know, that's been used for things like lobbying or, or um, other initiatives, but never for infrastructure. On the, uh, let's see, eighth, I uh, just want to alert that uh, for our agenda for scale, uh, there is the full scale is going to meet via Zoom on, on the eighth at our normal time. And, uh, Angie Craig will be making a presentation. Um, there'll be a COVID update, election of officers, and so forth. That's part of the agenda. Then on the fourth, uh, the mobility management board met, and again, the, I learned that they're not allowing masks, are not using masks, or requiring masks um, rather on their on their smaller buses, and I think that's a, a not a good practice. So it's kind of disappointing to hear that. The volunteer legislation that allows volunteers to be paid at the regular reimbursement, reimbursement rates, that, um, that, that legislation is obviously stalled because the legislature is taking up a, a limited amount of items in this session with the, with the virus. So that's the end of my report. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I have a oh, question yes. from Commissioner Ulrich. There we go. Uh, scale meeting is a virtual meeting on s Friday. Mm -hmm. Will the, yes. don will the donuts be virtual too, or how, how do we <laughs> cover donut. that? Of if, course, if see? Uh, if you can eat a donut with a mask on, you know, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a good diet approach, don't you think? Yeah. I, I could be up to the challenge. Uh, see you on Friday. <laughs> Can't wait. Can't wait. Oh, good stuff. Commissioner Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the 22nd, the Mosquito Control District, we're... Uh, um, they're going ahead with some of their plans. I don't think they're going to hire as many people, you know, this year as they had thought because of what's going on. Uh, and they're starting to talk about budgeting for next year. On the 23rd, Vermilion River Watershed, uh, they're going ahead with all their projects as planned. Elko New Market uh, had their uh, bi-monthly meeting on the uh, 23rd also, and uh, just a short meeting. They got uh, um, a couple things going on uh, right now. The Roundabout is actually started up there on 91 mm. and uh, 2 out there. So that's uh, they're looking forward to that. They're also concerned about the um, CDA, and I see that's on our um, workshop here and what's going to happen there. I was out at the fairgrounds on the 24th. They had uh, the soil and water had uh, their tree pickup. I uh, um, accidentally ordered 100 trees to plant. And, uh, <laughs> Accidentally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know I wish I'd have got 150. Anyhow, I got 50 more I'm going to get somewhere else on Thursday. <laughs> they didn't have Tamraks at, uh, here, so I have to get them up at Wright County on Thursday. Then on uh, the 27th, I met with uh, Leslie. Uh, just, and these are all mostly Skype uh, type of meetings. 
and then the WMO had their meeting on the 27th. The insurance committee met on the 29th. The, um, the, uh, um, the costs have gone up a little bit and they're looking at raising the premiums. I, I thought it was about 3%. We're gonna see how that goes, but uh, there's been some, uh, some big expenses in there and uh, they wanna keep their number of months of, of uh, insur uh, dollars uh, up to about five, six months in there so uh, they don't fall behind. Uh, after that, the, uh, on the 29th, the uh, mural uh, discussion, we uh, have picked a artist uh, from Scott County here. He's done some work uh, around the area, uh, Greg Preslika. And so we're gonna work with him on getting a good design. And like I've said the last couple of meetings, we've had some very good uh, uh, participants and some good choices to make on that. And uh, I think it's gonna look, uh, it's gonna look really great. I uh, met with Eric Pratt on the first, uh, about some of this stuff we have talked about earlier. Uh, out at uh, County Road 87 with a constituent yesterday who was worried about the dust and uh, they actually brought the truck mm -hmm. out with the dust coating stuff and that they're very happy because mm -hmm. the wind has been blowing so hard it blows the dust over it and uh, they can barely go outside and I believe it because it's been windy the last few days and it's getting drier so um, we need a little rain. <clears throat> and then Prior Lake City had their uh, workshop and city council meeting last night. Credit River had their meeting and uh, Cedar Lake had their uh, monthly meeting. And uh, that is my report. Thank you very much. Many of these were mentioned, but uh, again, I'll just go through the 421 uh, workshop. A lot of good discussion there, which culminated in some activity here today. On the 28th, Chair, Vice Chair, always appreciate the good discussions we have, um, things we get to chew on there. Um, that was uh, talked about as well. Now, I believe this was the 27th. There, um, Representative or Congresswoman Angie Craig and Senator Tina Smith co-hosted a Zoom meeting for small businesses and I just dialed in because I had the opportunity um, to listen to, they, they were answering questions that people could uh, send in via email just to try to help people, walk people through that process. Um, so any help we can get for our folks, again, I don't give two shakes if it's blue or red, we need the help. Um, so I was appreciative of the, uh, the Two of them hosting that for small businesses um, in our county uh, and larger. Um, let's see, and the 30th, I believe it was, had a phone uh, call with our Senator Eric Pratt as uh, talking about some of these same issues. Um, also, I believe it was in the first, just um, conversing with Congresswoman Craig's office about signing off as well on that letter. Um, to try to get some of those fundings back in our state for counties our size. Um, I was trying to be very specific that yes, I support trying to bring some of our money back home because I, I don't know what the number is of a state. We export way more taxes like we are towards the bottom. So um, I know we have to play this game in, on two different uh, tracks and that's why I wanted to sign off on that because we need the help. Countless phone calls, Zooms um, with other things, lots of constituent calls with rightfully so, it's it's the tax season. So, um, and I I always say I like those calls the most because you're meeting, that's where the rubber meets the road, but some of these um, discussions have been very hard um, as we all understand. So with that, that concludes my report. Looking to our county administrator, Leslie Vermillion. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, um, just real quick, an update on the, the 83 agreement, um, it, you know, that we had at the 21st workshop and then the chair vice chair meeting um, was a little contentious. But I want to thank Mr. Reynolds, the city administrator, for moving that forward. You approved it this morning. The city's supposed to take action tonight and on County Highway 42 tonight. I know that was a big concern um, that we were a month into that and still did not have that agreement. So that's being acted on as well tonight. Um, and then Mr. Sampson um, committed to meeting with us over the next few weeks here when he can work that in as his business is having some changes as sure. well um, to meeting and taking care of what we need to between Canterbury and the county. So very positive that that's going to move forward and a lot of um, input here from the board and your highway staff and the county attorney's office. Jeannie was just instrumental in, in moving that right of entry forward on Friday afternoon as well, so they could begin work yesterday. So that was good. Um, just one other thing, the, um, the Commissioner Brecky commented on the build grant and there's 
kind of a philosophy behind why those were on there, and the chair, vice chair, highway talked about it with them, but the bigger projects tend to score well there, right? They're bigger, they're more impactful to the region. We took and sliced out the overpass and the interchange as separate projects for the tab submittal, um, for the cost benefit portion of it, because that's looked at highly there. And then there still are the um, safety projects that come up in June uh, around about at 69 and 78. And I believe um, we're discussing with MnDOT at the Transportation Committee this week, 13 and 8. So those are still in process and didn't have the same timeline in case you had any questions um, on those. Let's see here. There is no work session next week. You know, we've tried to consolidate the meetings and not have people coming and going. We're doing the work session on the... 2019 closeout in the first quarter um, today, and then trying to model, but we won't have April or May's data, especially April's till we get into early June, starting to um, work on the budget more specifically. But as you're aware, we've done a lot of those freezes already on staff, on training, on travel, all those things that we've talked about at previous meetings, um, and looking at where we need to make some changes moving forward. So after the meeting today, we are again going to talk about the first quarter, 2019, the Elko New Market um, update with the CDA. Um, I believe Stacy has a good presentation to give you on how those meetings have progressed since what seems a long time ago now, yeah, <laughs> when we sat in here with the city, mm -hmm. the township, yeah. the CDA, and the county board. Um, so you'll get an update on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Looking to my right. County Attorney Hosovar. Don't need, don't need to meet with me. All right, always good to hear that from your lips. Thank you for that. Um, with that, oh, we want, what do we want to mention? Just that we're going to workshop that. Okay. She, she had mentioned that. Yeah, we are good. After this meeting, we are going to meet with, uh, uh, where are we at here, with the uh, Elko New Market uh, and the CDA with that infrastructure project that we've talked about. Um, 2019 year-end financial update, 2020 first quarter financial update as well. So we will be doing that next. So with that... Mr. Chair, I will move to adjourn. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? This is always the... All right, looking to Deb. Commissioner Reckman Brecky. Aye. Commissioner Wolf. Aye. Commissioner Beard. Aye. Commissioner Beer. Aye. Commissioner Ulrich. We are adjourned.